Raphael Lewis Corbin, who was born Lewis Canterbury Collingwood Corbin, did things that no one else dared do, and it puts him in a special category. It would never have been possible for persons like me to traverse through this world without the, the efforts of Lewis Corbin. I find it very, very respectful of what he was prepared to do. But let me tell you something about what kind of golfer this guy was. So when he played in the Canadian Open in 1947, evidently he didn't have enough money to get a hotel. He slept at the train station and he claimed that his golf clubs were stolen and that his money was stolen. So he found $10 from a fan for the entry fee, borrowed clubs for the event, shot a 74 uh, the first day, which was three over par. Then the next day shot a 67, which was four under par. That 67 in the second round is, is just amazing. But for this man to do these things all alone, he tried to get others involved, but could not and is just a remarkable testament to his to his boldness uh, to his bravery uh, to his courage to his perseverance and, and dedication and uh, Corbin uh, was genuinely a, a, a race man many people don't understand the the social and political racial economic significance of golf or of sport golf has the potential to bring persons together. I think the sport can play a number of roles. It can be accommodationist, but when we look at Muhammad Ali, or Bill Russell, or the Jim Brown of the 1960s, even Jack Johnson, we see black athletes who have taken on the system uh, directly and who have contributed to you know, the civil rights movement. And golf has certainly done that in the United States and it's had an important role in racial progress in Bermuda uh, as well. And of course, the battle still continues. Joe Lewis, who we know as one of the great boxers of all time, heavyweight champion of the world from 1937 to 1949, was an avid golfer and helped to actually project golf as something that wasn't for the elites and helped to popularize golf among African Americans. But he also sponsored tournaments, he sponsored players, and of course he always had professional instructors. And it so happened that Raphael Lewis Corbin was one of his early golf instructors. He was my uncle, my youngest uncle. He was short like my grandfather. He had real pretty curly hair. He was like light, like dark olive complexion. But he was very intelligent. He was, because I can remember him in the little golf club up at St. George Club, and it, he used to run that. He would sell the golf balls and t-shirts and things like, you would call t-shirts now, golf shirts and things like that. I can remember him sitting in there. The first time I actually met Corbin was on an evening time, I was probably 10, 11, out there with my one golf club and he was on the fourth tee, which was a par three, hitting balls to this green. Corbin would hit balls off a watch. He had a guy that would lay down on the ground with a tee in his mouth of a ball and hit him. And that he also lost a lot of money to a cousin of mine, which Corbin at one time had to give up his bike. But they let him take the bike before he can ride back to St. George's and he never did pay his debt. He, he stepped to his own tune. <laughs> Corbin says he came to the United States for the first time in 1925. I haven't found evidence of that, but he was here in 1929, played in many tournaments, was a contender uh, in all of them, and won quite a few. Corbin would become the first black to play in the Michigan Open Golf Tournament. This was in 1938. The authorities tried to prevent him from playing. He said, show me where in your rules and bylaws and constitution where I can't play. And he said, I'm calling John Roxborough, who was uh, one of Joe Lewis's managers, and his lawyer is going to uh, be involved in this. So in order to tamp down any kind of you know, serious uh, uh, trouble, uh, they allowed Corbin to play in the 38 Michigan 
uh, open. I came across uh, this unknown figure, relatively unknown, James R. Jimmy DeVoe, who was a golf professional from the 1920s. Interestingly, DeVoe was sort of an arbiter or authority on black golf. He not only played, he not only instructed, but he wrote about it in the Amsterdam News. He was the head professional of the St. Nicholas Golf Club, which was an organization of black golfers uh, in New York. Uh, and as it turned out, Raphael Lewis Corbin would become a member of the St. Nicholas uh, Golf Club. But he also started to become a rival of, of Jimmy DeVoe for the title of uh, authority of, of black golf. And it was through this rivalry that, that uh, I found that uh, Corbin was this fascinating character. And it turns out to be sort of a, a tortoise and hare story where uh, DeVoe was very cautious, very careful, uh, very measured, non-confrontational. Corbin was just the opposite and challenged the racial mores of the United States in ways that no other black golfer had. He took on the United States Golf Association for not allowing blacks to play in its championship and called them out publicly when they refused to accept the applications of these golfers saying that they weren't qualified to play, whereas DeVoe was much more passive in that respect and said, well, black golfers weren't good enough. So what Corbin did, I think, told blacks uh, in America what they could do. So he integrates the Michigan Open. He integrated the Canadian Open in 1939. He would come back and play in the Canadian Open as the only black again. He also integrated local tournaments, or at least tried to, in the United States, for example, he was playing in the Metropolitan Golf Association tournament in 1936, which was a, a major PGA uh, event with the likes of Gene Saracen and Henry Picard playing. And he was pulled off of the course on the eighth hole by claims that uh, he had not paid his, his entry fee. He was entered in the Belmont Open uh, international match play tournament in Massachusetts in 1937. Byron Nelson drives in the $12,000 Belmont Massachusetts tournament. Henry Pickard, the other finalist, tees off, and despite a downpour of rain, there's a large gallery. Byron Nelson won, Byron Nelson being one of the greatest American golfers of all time, to show you that Corbin wasn't just willing to play in these black golf tournaments to, to accept the status quo. He was trying to break down barriers. He was listed as having withdrawn from that tournament. So I think when they saw him, uh, they said, no way uh, you're going to play. After having played in the Canadian Open in 1939, he tried to enter the United States through uh, Detroit and was apprehended for having overstayed his visa. It was later reported when he tried to come back uh, that he was an undesirable. Now, Corbin had done something that was a little bit shady, it seems, in New York that actually involved Jimmy DeVoe. A gentleman by the name of Elmer Brent, who was a good golfer and a member of the St. Nicholas Golf Club, reported Louis Raphael Corbin to the immigration authorities. He had already reported him to the local police and wasn't satisfied with you know, the results. So he took it to the immigration authorities and did it twice, as a matter of fact, and said that Corbin had ripped him off by promising for $20 to provide him with golf apparel uh, or equipment and never delivered. He said that Corbin had taken clubs from Jimmy DeVoe's golf shop and Bloomstein's department store in New York to sell and never gave DeVoe the money for those clubs that he had operated some kind of illegal raffle or lottery and uh, collected money but never returned any money to those who had given it to him. This was in 36, so he left the United States 
and then came back. So they had this on him when he returned uh, and used it. Interestingly, he was also listed with two names and they combined his file because he was Louis Raphael Corbin in one file and Louis Canterbury Collingwood Corbin in another and then they finally understood that he was one and the same person. There's much in a name. And how did he come up with Louis Raphael Corbin? We know that Bermuda had a Spanish history uh, at some point in time, but I think that Corbin also understood that in America, blacks who were seen as foreign in some way were privileged or more privileged than native born, you know, African Americans. So I think that he was in some ways playing a racially ambiguous game here. When I went to school, he was Lewis. And then after I started to grow up, he was a reporter at the Recorder and he changed his name to Raphael. They used to call him the reporter that snooped around and he would put all sorts of things in the paper. <laughs> yeah. In that tournament in the Metro Hall and Golf Association tournament, which was at, ironically, an all-Jewish country club called Quaker Ridge in Westchester, New York, that reporters came on the scene uh, and told the story, but also asked Corbin what he was. Was he Filipino? Uh, was he uh, colored? Uh, and, or was he Cuban? And he said, I am what you think I am. So he would not and, and oftentimes would enter tournaments and not include Bermuda, but would say that he was from New York, et cetera. His name was an important part of a strategy for being able to insinuate himself into the system that others could not. And the other thing is, he just didn't do this for himself or oftentimes alone. When he tried to get into the USGA event, the US Open, he had James Bates, James McCoy, and Clifford Taylor join him in applying for the event. On numerous occasions, he wrote to Canadian officials about bringing a team, which he called the Goodwill Bermudian team, to Canada. Well, there were only two players from Bermuda on that team, Llewellyn DeRosa and Raphael Lewis Corbin. The rest were black Americans. So, I think that he used this ambiguous identity to uh, break through, but also he was willing to include others in. And by the way, Jimmy DeVoe was also racially ambiguous. So he's racially ambiguous and also very passive, right? And plays the system by being a part of the system. Corbin tried to tear it down. He knew something well beyond himself. Because usually, you know, I mean, and I, and I look uh, at, at athletes like uh, Muhammad Ali to think of what they were prepared to do in their prime. And I'm appreciative of what uh, Corbin had to do during that, during that period, I really am. I would never have gotten the opportunity had he not. If you couldn't participate in golf, it's like what Martin Luther King has said. I know that justice is indivisible. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that's something that we don't understand. That we think of golf as this elitist, inconsequential, trivial activity. But it's very important to establishing black respectability, black capacity, uh, that blacks can do everything that whites could do. Corbin was, you know, the model, uh, the exemplar of uh, the notion that, that, that blacks could do the things that whites could do. As a golf practitioner now uh, for some um, 38 uh, years, that's one area where the black business community has not uh, been uh, sufficiently represented in private country clubs. Even on the PGA Tour, where we used to be the caddies at the Masters, the caddies on the PGA Tour, where we were connected with the game, we've been displaced. Anyone who knows business knows and appreciates that most of the big deals are made on the golf course. And in, in, in golf, as I've learned, it's who you know. If we're missing from this important link of business networking, we are still missing the boat. 
And it's important that persons appreciate this construct that's, that's in place. And that's where sport, uh, particularly in golf, has, 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 has meant uh, to, uh, to the business world. Ocean View and Port Royal, now since 1970, were integral part of allowing persons, particularly from the African Bermudian community, uh, to express our talents without impediment. And it certainly, um, Ocean View First um, was not a course just for, for blacks. It was a course for everyone that predominantly had blacks who, who were a part of it. And, and I think that's important to, to, to capture as well because the black community in, in, in this country has always been willing to participate in the integration uh, effort and have always been the ones who have moved towards integrating Bermuda. When Port Royal emerged on the scene, as a world-class golf course, everybody wanted a piece of, to play Port Royal. Everybody wanted to express their talents. Anyone could play there. We had visitors who came here. Uh, we had Jack Nicholas who came to Bermuda to play. Greg Norman came to Bermuda as an emerging young golfer. Blacks and whites didn't have to arrange games before the crack of dawn to be able to play a world-class golf course. Notwithstanding that Ocean View were producing world-class talent that were breaking down the door. So in that emergence of golf came that period where uh, Bermuda was starting to see that integrated era take shape. they say about it's not the size of the dog in a fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog that matters. Uh, I think Corbin typifies that. He died in 1951 at the age of 44. When my grandfather got the news that he was in the hospital and he was sick and he died, they brought his body here, but the rumor kept going around that he was shot because he had, he had a reputation of running his mouth. You know what I mean? And people didn't like that. People don't like if you tell them the truth. You look straight in the face and tell them the truth, they don't like it. He actually died of some form of, of, of meningitis. Uh, and this turned out to be a very sad occasion for uh, many in the sports world uh, in the United States. He had that kind of reputation, especially with the sports writers. And in fact, there's a story of, of black athletes and events in 1951, and Corbin's death is listed in, in that. So uh, he held a special place. But Russ Cowens, uh, who was a sports columnist for the Pittsburgh Courier, uh, seems to have uh, been uh, the one who was uh, knew Corbin the best. And one of the things that Corbin did was to send a material to these newspapers about his exploits in Bermuda, and he would do it in the third person, and they would basically publish it verbatim. <laughs> you know? So in any event, this is Russ uh, Cowan's eulogy, which best sums up the man uh, and his impact. He'll be missed. Louis Raphael Corbin died last week in Detroit. Those who knew the colorful little West Indian will miss his pungent remarks, keen wit, and deep knowledge of the game. It was back in 1936 that I first met Corbin, a fiery-tempered little fellow who in the passing years became the torch that started a number of fires during various tournaments. He was at one time under suspension by the United Golfers Association for some infraction of the rules and regulations, but Corbin seemed to get great enjoyment out of this and was always ready and willing to fight for what he thought was right. Corbin was not only the stormy petrel of golf, he caused some difficulties for immigration authorities. While back in Bermuda, Corbin, a prolific letter writer, kept the desk of sports editors covered with letters, pointing out the defects in a certain tournament or extolling the abilities of young golfers he had discovered in the West Indies. There was no middle ground with Corbin. He was either walloping in the ecstasies of enjoyment or sunk in the glum of despondency. At the height of his enjoyment, he could tell some fantastic tales about his experiences on golf courses. When the tournament season rolls around, there'll be a void because we'll miss the courageous little Corbin, a guy who could blister a sports writer with a tongue lashing or make him wilt under his praise.